Documentaries and the wilderness go hand in hand, and some of the best docs ever have been made in some of the world's most remotest places. But have you ever wondered how the people filming them actually keep uh, production running in the middle of nowhere without losing their minds? Well, that's exactly what this video is all about. Six lessons that I've learned about how to shoot in the wilderness without going crazy. Hey guys, welcome back. And in case you missed the last couple of videos, I'm obviously not in my office right now. I'm still way up in the Canadian Arctic where I'll be for the next two months or so shooting a TV show. Because even though it seems like all I do is make these YouTube videos, I'm actually a full-time DP, and so for the next while anyways, we're gonna have to make do without all the studio lighting and soundproof panels. But since this video is about filming in the wilderness, I guess it's pretty fitting. Of course. And this kind of thing is actually pretty normal for me because if I look back on my career, I've spent over two years of my life living in a tent and I've spent more time carrying cameras through the forest than I can really remember. I'm probably more comfortable in an environment like this than I would be on a Hollywood set, to be honest. And so as I packed up my stuff to come up here, I realized that this was a perfect opportunity to go over some of the tips and tricks I've learned over the years when it comes to how to keep your shoot running in the wild. And beyond just the technical stuff, how do we as filmmakers stay happy and healthy when we're away from the comforts of the city for long stretches of time. So let's get into it. Well, to start with, you can have all the best gear and be super motivated to get out there and shoot. But if you can't get the stuff you want to the right location, it's not gonna do you much good. So even for me to walk around these woods and to find a place to actually sit down and set up the camera to make this video, the very first tip that I'd probably give anyone thinking they wanna shoot in a remote place is to make sure you have a great backpack. And to me, a great backpack isn't one of those space age looking things that are all smooth and futuristic. It should be more like a hiking pack that holds camera gear than a camera bag that happens to be out in the woods. Gear is heavy and moving it from place to place sucks if you don't have a pack that's balanced with straps and good weight distribution. So as cool as those sleek travel backpacks look, they're not really right for an environment like this, in my opinion. Hold on, I think there's a clearing up there where I can put this stuff down and actually show you what I mean. Okay. All right, is that level? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so what makes a great camera pack for me? Well, the first is that it has to be designed to carry heavy loads for long periods of time. So it should really be designed more like a hiking bag than a cool camera bag. It needs really solid straps, a really good hip belt to take the load off my shoulders, and it should be made out of a tough weather resistant material. I also think it's a great idea if it opens from the inside part or this part, the part that sits against your back, however you describe that, because that way you can put the bag on dirty or wet ground um, and still get in at your stuff while keeping the tough side facing down. I personally use f-stop bags but there's a lot of other great companies out there who make great packs. This really isn't about me promoting one brand or another. The point is that if you want to bring your gear into remote or rough locations it all starts with a pack that's designed to be in those environments. And while we're out here the next tip is just as important as having the right backpack and that's making sure that you're dressed properly because if you're miserable out here you're not going to do your best work. Again we're going to take our used from the backpacking and mountaineering worlds here by dressing in layers. Now, if it's super hot where you're working, you really just need to prioritize one comfortable base layer that covers you from the sun. But if you're working in places like I am right now, where you're dealing with cold, wind, rain, snow, sometimes all of those things in the same day, it's all about stacking layers on top of each other. It starts with your base layer, which is what goes right up against your skin. And for me, there's nothing better than a long sleeve merino wool shirt. You never ever want your base layer to be cotton because you're gonna freeze the second it gets wet. And you also don't want synthetic fabrics unless you plan on doing laundry every other day because things like polypropylene or poly polypropylene start to stink really, really fast and everyone around you is gonna hate you. Wool stays warm even if you're soaked and it's antimicrobial so it can go days and days without smelling bad, which really does matter if you're working with other people. There is nothing worse than one really stinky person on the crew and it's so awkward to talk about, so just don't be that person and wear wool. You'll want merino wool specifically here because it isn't itchy like normal thick wool and it can be worn in warmer weather too. So for my money, it's just the best thing out there for a base layer. Then depending on how cold it gets, you stack extra layers on top of that. So like I have this thick uh, down jacket and in here's also a rain shell if it starts to get really 
really wet. This is all just hiking 101. So if you're already really comfortable in outdoor situations, this might be obvious, but generally you want to think about your base layer, then a mid layer, and then an outer shell. The base layer traps heat and moves moisture away from the skin. The mid layer insulates and keeps you warm, and the outer layer or shell blocks the wind and keeps you dry. So like for me right now, it's pretty warm out, but the temperature is fluctuating like crazy. So in the morning it's freezing and I've got like a down jacket on, then a shell over top of it. And then as it gets warmer, I take one layer off and then another layer until right now where it's pretty nice and pleasant and I'm just down to my base layer. Later in the season, as it gets colder and colder and then below freezing, I'll use a thicker mid layer or even two mid layers. And when it gets really cold, I'll swap out the rain shell for an insulated jacket that's still water resistant. By the time I leave here, it should be about 40 below. So those extra layers are gonna be super important. And since I just mentioned rain shells, this is probably a good segue into the third tip, which is that when you're filming in environments like this, rain is your worst enemy. Nothing will shut your camera gear down faster than water, and even tiny amounts of moisture can be enough to wreck a camera if it gets into the wrong place. On this production right now I'm on, for example, we have five camera bodies with us, even though there's only two DPs, because on a long enough timeline, it's almost guaranteed that we're gonna have problems, and most of those problems start with rain. So I always wanna make sure that I have something with me that I can cover my camera with in case it starts raining. The premium version of that uh, might be something like this, which is a custom fitted port brace cover that's built specifically for the cameras we're using, which right now are Sony FS7 Mark I, super old cameras. I have something similar to this that's made for my FX9 and they make versions for almost every camera system out there. They're not cheap at all, but if you're dealing with rain a lot like I am, they're worth it. And you can shoot in some pretty wet conditions with something like this. Now, if you're only dealing with occasional unexpected drizzles and you just need something to hold you over until you can get to to cover, then you could save a bunch of money and just use one of those elasticized backpack covers. You can get these really cheaply on Amazon and you just stretch the elastic all around the important bits. And even if it's not quite as elegant as a custom porta brace, it will keep your camera dry enough for most reasonable conditions. Oh, and when it comes to your audio packs, a pro tip is to keep a couple condoms with you. Uh, you can stretch them around a wireless transmitter and they'll stay dry through pretty much any kind of rain. And even though your subjects are probably gonna look at you a little funny when you pull them out in the middle of the forest, they really do work. And while we're on the topic of rain damage, the fourth tip I wanna give you is that if you wanna do your best work in tough environments like this, you need to let go of your gear anxiety and accept the fact that your stuff is probably gonna take some damage. <laughs> Now, I know that gear is a massive investment for people and that it hurts to put it in harm's way. I actually destroyed my own personal FS7 a couple years ago with my own sweat while working in a bat cave in Kenya. So trust me, I know how much it sucks when you brick a camera that you can't afford to replace. But if you're out in a place like this and you're here to make films, there's no way around it. Your gear is gonna suffer. Now, this is more of a psychological issue than anything because the only way to work through it is just to accept it as part of the job and not freak out when something inevitably gets damaged. For for sure, you have to have insurance beforehand, but apart from that, there's really not that much you can do other than take a deep breath and keep shooting. If you let your anxiety about protecting your gear overwhelm you though, you're gonna keep your stuff in the bag instead of actually shooting with it, and then it's not really doing you any good. The tough reality of filmmaking is that lenses get scratched, cameras get wet, drones crash, and memory cards fall in the mud. It's just the way it goes. So get a good rain cover, get insurance, and the best backpack you can, and then do your best to let the gear anxiety go so you can get back to getting the shots you need to tell a great story. And that's a great segue into my fifth tip because when your stuff does get dirty, as it will, you're gonna wanna have a solid cleaning slash toolkit on hand. Now, building up a filmmaking toolkit, which is pretty much the same thing as a camera assistant or AC pouch, is one of the best bang for your buck investments you can make when it comes to gear. This is mine and it's not glamorous or sexy or anything like that, but the usefulness to price ratio is crazy. And I brought this bag on every single shoot I've been on for the last eight years or so. The pouch itself is made by Cinebags. Uh, I'll put a link in the description, but you can go with any brand you want. Inside, I have a multi-tool, some Allen keys, uh, a rocket blower, lens tissues, some bongo ties, a headlamp so I can see what I'm doing in the dark, 
a toothbrush, and a broken off paintbrush. Dust and sand can be almost as bad for your camera as rain and water. So the blower and the brushes are great for the end of the day when you look down and like your whole camera is covered in a layer of grime. Now I'm no means meticulous about caring for my gear and I'm actually sort of notorious for being extremely uncareful with my stuff, much to the dismay of past camera assistants, but I still do put a base level of care and maintenance to make sure that I'm not ruining stuff unnecessarily. And for the most part, my gear keeps on working. So build up a cleaning kit early on. It's cheap and it's never gonna go out of date. And when you need it, you really need it. Okay, so the sun is starting to set and there are a lot of bears up here, grizzly bears and black bears. So I wanna get in before night falls. But one thing I've noticed about filmmakers, myself included, is that we can be really bad uh, for bringing a lot of of stuff with us on every shoot that may or may not get used. As my camera assistants have learned the hard way, yes, we really do need nine V-mount batteries and five lenses carried into the woods today. But even though more than one of them has probably cursed me as they lugged a bunch of stuff through the bush, the truth is that I really have to force myself to be selective in the gear I bring on remote shoots like this. And that's the last tip for today. Be selective with what you bring and prioritize versatility. <laughs> Like if I look inside my shooting bag right now, which we're not actually gonna do because that's for another video, I've only got three lenses with me, a 24-105, a 60 to 600 super zoom, and a 100 millimeter macro. Now, do I think these are the best three lenses that have ever been made and are gonna get me the best quality possible? No, not really but they do cover a huge range without overlapping too much and I can physically carry them all day. And that's what has to take precedence sometimes as much as we might want to bring all the toys. Would I love to have my CineZoom set with a bunch of 1.4 primes and a 2.8 zoom instead of a 5.6 to 6.3? Definitely. Does it make sense to crush myself to get that stuff here so that I'm gonna have a hard time keeping up this pace day after day for three months? No, it doesn't. So when it comes to working in remote spots, you're gonna have to make sacrifices when it comes to the gear you bring. And unless you have a team of porters and a bunch of super strong ACs, there's no way around it. So my best advice for prepping your gear and your shooting bag is to take a hard look at what you're bringing and ask yourself, is this a must have or just a nice to have? And then make some tough choices. Because at the end of the day, the best gear in the world won't help you if you're too too tired to get to the top of that next ridge or if your back hurts so much that you need to take a day off. Focus on versatility and save those extra fun toys for the shoot days when you have a car nearby. So there we go. Six tips for how to make your life a little bit easier when shooting in remote wilderness locations. I'm going to be out here for the next couple of months at least, so there's a lot more videos coming up, including a full bag tour, maybe like a day in the life, and whatever else you might be interested in. So drop a comment if you really want to know something about working in a place like this, and I'll do my best to cover it soon. Hope that one was helpful, and for now, I need to get out of here before the safety guys chew me out. See ya!